Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to the inaugural Cohen Center Talk of 2018. We certainly appreciate your presence, whether it's here in, in person or via our live streaming to YouTube. Today, we are very fortunate to have our Cohen Center visiting scholar, Dr. Kirk St. Amant, with us. At this time, I want to recognize our co-sponsors of Kirk's trip to JMU, the College of Integrated Science and Engineering, the School of Communication Studies, Cross-Disciplinary Studies and Diversity Engagement, and the School of Writing, Rhetoric, and Technical Communication. After his prepared remarks, Kirk hopes to engage the audience in a discussion about issues you wish to raise based upon or inspired by his talk. When I asked Dr. St. Amant if he had a standard blurb I should use to introduce him, he replied, just use three words. This is Kirk. I guess he's a Star Trek fan. <laughs> and while I can appreciate Kirk's desire for brevity and respect, and I respect the humbleness of his demeanor, I feel that a slightly extended introduction is required. Kirk has always been interested in cross-cultural and international aspects of technical communication, whether it be his work in his undergraduate uh, degree at Bowdoin College, his graduate work here at JMU, where he was the very first graduate 20 years ago of the Institute for Technical and Scientific Communication, now WRTC, or his doctoral work at the University of Minnesota, Kirk has always sought to make connections between and across disciplines and cultures. After teaching at JMU, Texas Tech, and East Carolina University, Kirk has spent the last two years serving as professor and Eunice C. Williamson Endowed Chair in Technical Communication, a joint appointment between the College of Liberal Arts and the College of Engineering at Louisiana Tech University. He also serves as the director of both the Health and Medical Communication Center and the Usability and User Experience Design Center. At present, Kirk has co-edited 13 books with two more in development. His willingness to work with others is a testament to his desire to collaboratively investigate the subject matter that has intrigued him for some 25 years. His 2016 book, co-edited with Martine Caron Reif, Legal Issues in Global Contexts, won the Award of Excellence from the Society of Technical Communication. He was also the 2015 recipient of the Ken Rainey Award for Excellence in Research from the Society for Technical Communication. His talk today, Cognition, Care, and Culture, Integrating User Experience Design into International Health and Medical Communication Practices focuses on frameworks for addressing cultural factors when designing medical technologies and information. Please help me welcome Kurt to JMU and the Cohen Center. This is Kurt. Thank you, Dr. Klein, and thank you all for the chance to speak with you today. Uh, real quick before we start off, a confession and a favor. The confession, I have a natural predisposition to being boring, which means that we try to keep things as short as possible. Now, here's where the favor comes in. My grandmother taught us, you don't talk at people, you speak with them. So what I would ask is, don't do this as a presentation where you talk at somebody. I'd rather this be a conversation where we speak with each other. And so as I'm discussing things here today, please feel free to present opinions, ideas, comments. This needs to be interactive for it to really be fun, because otherwise, for those of you who know what it's called, whenever you walk into a room, is that the first thing you look for? And when, if you ever see it, you go, OK, is it a certain color? Is it a certain design? Is it a certain dimension? Is it a certain size? Or you not even think about it ever? Well, first of all, those of you who know what it's called, what's it called? The Aglet. The Aglet. Awesome, A-G-L-E-T. I learned that a long time ago, and also it's the weirdest thing ever. Now, why don't most of us know what it's called? And those of you who know what it's called, don't pay attention to it. Because in our culture, it really doesn't matter that much. We don't associate a lot of importance with it. And so for that reason, we don't pay attention to it. It does not indicate something we've got to keep track of and understand. Why that's important is it reflects how our minds work and how culture shapes reality. 
Now think about it this way. Every second, our brains through our five senses bring in far more information than we can ever process. So if we were sort of a computing unit, we should shut down instantly because there's more input than our, our central processing unit can deal with. Why don't we do it? We need some sort of mechanism to screen stuff out and identify what do we pay attention to. Once we know what to pay attention to, how do we interpret that thing? And once we've interpreted it, what do we do with it? Do we look for aglets when we walk into a room? If we see an aglet, when we see its design, what does that tell us about the person who has it? And once you've got the design, what does that tell us about how we communicate with that person? In these ways, our culture shapes our cognition or how we think. It tells us what dynamics to pay attention to. While this sounds kind of interesting in relation to footwear, it gets very bizarre and quite problematic when it comes to medical and health care and communication. Because those same differences, what to pay attention to, how to interpret it, and what to do with it, can be an issue of life or death, depending upon the culture you're in and how you share information about your wellness. So with that said, this is where I start to bore you a bit, so humor me real quick. Three terms or concepts to talk about that are interrelated but not interchangeable, which get us to the root of these cognitive problems, are health, medicine, and, and care. So let's start with medicine, or medical, the big overall thing. Medical is a kind of bio, uh, excuse me, biochemical data, or the, re the responses of biochemical data we collect on the human body. Things like pulse rate, blood pressure, respiration rate. It's data about a certain, a certain process our body engages in. Now, the interesting part about that is that kind of data that we collect is not uniform or universal. So think of it this way. How many of y'all when you go for a physical, you expect them to take your blood pressure, medical information, your pulse rate, read your chi? How about check your aura? Now note, there's certain kinds of data we say, yes, this should be recorded, and it's a part of what we want to pay attention to when we gauge our health. For others, it's like, well, why you shouldn't be integrating this? But they represent different approaches to medicine from different cultural dynamics that do affect what we actually measure to try to figure out is someone healthy or not. So from this cultural perspective of cognition and reality, we begin to see breakdowns happen just in terms of what we measure. Now, health is interesting because it's the rubric, heuristic, or set of guidelines we use to interpret that medical data. So my blood pressure is 217 over 190. Is that bad? Mm -hmm. I, the medical people are like, <laughs> OK, so why is it bad? Health is, again, the standard that we take this information and it tells us how to interpret it. And quite often, it's based on averages. The average person should have this blood pressure to fall in the parameters of what we call healthy. And while blood pressure is a, pretty much a universally recognized medical diagnostic information we collect, its interpretation can vary over time. Um, consider, for example, just in the past few years, the American Heart Association has changed what it means to have high blood pressure. Originally, if I'm remembering correctly, it was 140 over 90 was normal blood pressure, or borderline high. Now that's dropped down to, I believe it's 130 over 80. So oddly enough, with the flip of the switch, whether I'm healthy or not has changed because a group in a specific culture came together and said, this is how we interpret it. That's within the same culture. Imagine what it means in terms of how different cultures read and interpret those diagnostic readings. So when it comes to health, that's a difference, again, that cognition and culture affect how we perceive and interact. Now, if these are problematic enough, it's the care part where things get very strange. Because care is the process we use to adjust our medical information that we produce to get within certain parameters of health to say that we're healthy again. In other words, care is action. Care is the activity that we perform, the thing that we do that keeps us healthy and keeps our medical statistics in a certain relationship. So these things are all intertwined. But there within, the question becomes, is care a universal? And it's not. We might all agree that my blood pressure needs to be between 130 over 80 to be normal. But what is the acceptable standard care treatment for that? Is it diet? Is it exercise? Is it acupuncture? Is it acupressure? What constitutes valid or legitimate care? Again, varies from culture to culture. And because care is a process, it has the greatest sort of opportunity for problem to arise because it's an activity at which cultures can engage in very different ways or methods trying to pursue the same result. And so what we'll talk about today or we'll look at today is this dynamic of what are these different dynamics of care, the things that we pursue, 
to try to achieve a certain health by regulating our medical data and statistics. Does this all kind of make sense? Because care is a process, we look at the concept of usability. And usability looks at how individuals take an object and use or make use of it in a given setting. We've all downloaded an app to our iPhone recently, and many of us have had the app that it's intuitive. I look at it, I know how it works, right? That design meets your expectations and you know how to use it. We've also all downloaded an app and you have no idea what to do with it. And how many of y'all have an app on your phone you can't get rid of but you don't know how to use? How many of y'all have helped a parent or grandparent remove an app from their phone they downloaded and couldn't use? <laughs> That's usability. How you design things inherently can people use them. This causes a lot of problem in health and medical communication and design because, again, different cultures can view the same thing in different ways. What we're talking about is sort of a transitional process that follows this sort of tiered mechanism. And it begins with the concept of patient-centered design, which comes out of health literacy. The idea there is, instead of the doctor designing information like a written document, instructions, for another doctor to use, you don't design for doctor to doctor, but the audience is the patient. What does the patient know about this topic? What can the patient do based upon that knowledge base? We write for them as audience. They're the center of what we do or what we design around. So this is patient-centered design. Now, while that is interesting because it focuses on audience, it eliminates one very important pr prospect, and that's context or setting. Because your personal experience is where you perform a healthcare activity or where you have it performed to you greatly affects what you think something should look like and how it should be used. For example, uh, how many of you have had your blood pressure taken in the past, say, month or so? How many of you have had it taken at a physician's office? All right, now think about it. What is done and what is used is one thing. How many of you have taken your own blood pressure through a device at, like, Walmart or CVS? A little, okay. Very different device, very different expectations on what it should look like, how it should be designed, affects whether you can use it or not. Has anybody gotten one of those wrist BP cuffs that you can use to take your blood pressure at home? Again, very different device, very different usage. Each context requires a different sort of design, so the person it's designed for can use it. That's different than designing a document for the patient based upon their understanding of something. It's based upon the context in which it happens. It's based on their experiences. So for that reason, we've seen an attempt to integrate two different fields, or two different areas. Health and medical communication, or if you will, patient-centered design with usability studies, or user experience design. It is something that looks at not just who the patient is, but what their experiences are, and how those experiences shape what they think something should look like. This is what Melanson has called patient experience design. You design the thing to mimic the context in which the patient has used it and seen it, so when they see it again, they can understand it. There's a problem here, however. That is that cultures design things. We design technologies, and technologies aren't culture-free. They're designed according to how we, as members of our own culture, expect people to use them in that culture. They're contextualized. As Sun has pointed out, this creates problems when you try to move a technology from one culture to the other. Historically, the process has been something called localization. Has anybody heard of that? So localization is you take something designed by one culture and you tweak it or modify it slightly and then use it in another culture to try to meet what's going on there. A classic example, in how many people have driven in Britain or the British Isles, like Ireland? Steering wheels on what side? Right, right side. So if we're going to go bring it over here, we've got to move that steering wheel over. That's an, an adjustment that needs to be made, but it can be made. That's a localized decision. Uh, how many people here have seen a Corvette? Great two-seat sports car, right? Now, my ability to turn that Corvette into a minivan and haul six kids, it, the Corvette isn't designed to be modified to that extent. There are limits to how much you can localize something based upon the context you've designed it for. As a result, particularly with health communication, we're seeing breakdowns. Bless you where people are saying, we can't just keep trying to repurpose something for a different culture. We've got to start from scratch and design independent entities for each cultural audience who will use them. So instead of me taking a defibrillator design for the United States and trying to repurpose it for, let's say, Namibia, can we create a, a defibrillator that's designed for and works in that Namibian context from the very beginning? This process of parallel cultural design is often called transcreation or globalization, developing multiple products of the same kind for different cultures from the very beginning. It's the foundation of something called International Patient Experience Design, IPXD, 
or the notion that we build the product, we design it from the very beginning to meet the cultural parameters that it's expected in, both the parameters of who the patient is, patient-centered design, and their experiences of where they use it, patient experience design. Does this all make sense? Now, there's a problem here, though. So what exactly do you look at and pay attention to to figure out how do you design the thing? Because inherently, for most of us, we know how to use an app. For most of us, we kind of know how to use email. Or we figure it out through observation over time. So what do we do when we've got to think about how to design for someone else from a completely different background? What do we look at? What do we do? And so that's what we're going to talk about here today a little bit. Our perspectives on how to research this topic, how to understand it, and how to approach it. That's kind of a fancy way of saying, I'm not here to report on research results. Rather, I'm here to share with you all a research approach or methodology to use to investigate this and think about how we as a culture, as a group, as a profession, might engage in this kind of research for the future. So let's go back to usability and user experience design for a minute. The two central factors we're looking at there is something called context of use. What is the setting in which somebody uses something? And what variables in that setting, what factors affect how it is used? Uh, for example, how many people here have used a hammer to pound a nail? OK. Now notice the way that the hammer is designed requires you to be able to manipulate it in a fairly open space. If I can't have this range of motion, the design of the hammer is useless. So in a context where I've got this much space to move in and I'm going to drive a nail, I need a very different technology or device. That variable of physical space affects the context of use and what is usable in that particular space. Based upon that foundation, IPXD looks at how can we extend that from usability to care. Not the context of use, but the context of care. And here's where things are interesting. It's not what are you trying to do, it's where are you trying to do it. In other words, it's great to say the objective of this document is to show you how to use this specific device to measure your own blood pressure. Great. Where am I measuring it? Is it at home? Is it at work? Is it at a physician's office? Is it on the bus on the way to work? What is that setting that I do it in? And how do I design it, that device, so I can use it easily in that setting? So what are the variables in play in that setting? These become the foundational factors that drive kind of the overarching research questions we look at. And they do move through a very methodological approach to try to figure them out. And so those are some of the things we're going to talk about today. So research questions and the understanding the context of care or contextualizing care. And please note, they need to happen in a certain sequenced order. While you've seen them before, the order becomes important. And quite often, it starts off with the concept of medical time. And by medical time, or what I like to call care time, when, at what point in time, at what point in your day, do you engage in a certain caregiving activity? Now notice, we're starting with when, not where. And the reason for the when part is the when dictates the where and everything else that goes into it. Where do you take your blood pressure? I take it in my, my kitchen. When do you take your blood pressure? I take it at 3.15 after I brought my kids home from school. There are two very different dynamics there. <laughs> with two very different sets of variables. So notice, when isn't, where is not important until you know the when. So when do you do it? Care, time care, care, a time, uh, time based, care based time, excuse me. When do you engage in the care activity? Once when, okay, where do you take it? Well, I take it at home, in my dining room. Perfect. Now that I know the when and the where, now I'm going to start tracking variables. And those variables are the two most important questions. Who performs the process? Well, I perform it on myself. OK, who else is in that area while you're performing the process? Well, there are my two children, then the two other children I bring home from school with them, and then my neighbor usually stops by because their television is broken to watch TV. Wait a minute. So how many people are in this space when you are performing the activity? And what are the, the dynamics involved in how you interact with them while you're trying to perform that activity? So we're, tr we're tracing who, the people there, is a variable. Or who performs this process? Who measures your blood pressure? Well, my next door neighbor is a registered nurse. And he knows every day at 3.15 I come home from work. And so he will come over with his partner. And his partner will watch the children while we go into the kitchen, and he takes my blood pressure. Completely different set of dynamics based upon that variable of who. So that's the first major variable we track, because that affects the next part, what. OK, we know who's performing the process. What are they using to perform it? 
uh, very quickly, how many people have used, again, one of those uh, BP cups that look like a, a di giant digital watch that you take home? And they're buggy, right? They give you error reading sometimes. Sometimes you, your blood pressure can jump like 60 points from reading to reading. So there's something about the technology. It's good. Uh, this is where I put in the caveat that I'm not making any criticism of any products by any companies. But the technology itself has some issues with it in terms of how it's used. Now, how many people have used the old-fashioned analog BP cuff with a stethoscope? They're clunky, and they're difficult to use, and you can really misread them if you don't know what you're doing. But if you really are competent in using them, and you can use them effectively, you can get some very effective readings off of them. So if I know who is going to be performing the process, I've got a registered nurse who could do this. What can be used could, will provide very different kinds of diagnostics, can offer very different kinds of care, depending upon those factors. So these are the other variables involved. What is involved in the process, and who is there that's affecting it? These become the variables of care. In terms of how do we design a technology, how do we design the instructions that tell somebody how to perform a care-related process is driven by what we know about these two factors. Who is there to perform it or be in the environment, and what are you using to do it? This gives us the single most important question of all, how do you do it? So once I know all the dynamics there, talk me through how you take your blood pressure as you're managing six children and sitting in your living room by your, or your dining room by yourself. How do you do it? How do you engage in the process of taking your blood pressure while your neighbor comes over and takes it and his partner is in the other room watching the children? So this, these are the dynamics we look at because if we know what they are, we know how to design something to use in that context. We know whether the, uh, the self-taking wrist BP cuff is the best method to use or if we should try to provide something that's more like the analog cuff we talked about before that's used by someone who's got a very great deal of expertise in using it. But that is everything to the design. So essentially, this is localized design that's taking things down to the very, very most basic common level of the individual and designing exactly for it. So it sounds like our job is done, we can go home, we're fine. Well, sadly, it's a little bit more complicated than that because we're dealing with cultures. And a series of different dynamics affect how cultures do things in general. And so what we're going to talk about for this next part is kind of like what are the dynamics you need to think of when you take this approach to sort of contextualize care and understanding the questions of contextualized care design and push them to the international level. So context of care at the international level involves two different kinds of related contexts. There's the physical context. What is the physical reality around you? And physical reality essentially is infrastructure, if you will. For example, is the power grid stable in your part of the world? Because that can affect what kinds of power devices you can use to engage in a care-related activity. Are the transportation infrastructures stable, safe, and operational? Because that can affect how quickly medical products can move from place to place, or how quickly you can get resupplied in medical products if they're not there. Is the financial infrastructure stable? Because that can affect how affordable something will be in terms of accessing it. So these geopolitical dynamics, the space you're physically in, which is inter information communication technology for development. And then notice something strange. With computing technologies, most Hardware is designed for use in industrialized nations, or it comes out of them, it's designed for them. So when you think about your standard desktop computer, it's designed to be used in a climate-controlled office environment with limited debris and dust floating around, right? And let's face it, if you find yourself in a wood shop with lots of sawdust around, you'd be really freaked out about using your computer there, because there'd be the concern with the fan clog. Well, what happens when you take this device that's designed to be used in a climate-controlled 65-degree Fahrenheit office in, say, the United States, and move it to the deserts of Namibia, where let's say the average ambient temperature during the day is maybe 120 degrees, that machine will overheat because it's not designed to operate in that physical context. And so the result is, they'll, in many cases, they'll pull apart the machine, take off things that expose the infrastructure to, to cool air, and hopefully cool it off. And of course, the response to that is, well, it comes with a fan, right? And the fan will kick on to cool it off if that happens. Yet, we're, do we mention the desert part with sand? And so the sand will clog the fan as quickly as you can pull it apart and hope to use it. So that design is not best suited for the physical context it's being used in. We need to rethink that practice. So this is an example of how physical content, uh, context affects the usability of design. The more complicated part, which is a little harder to understand or to study, is the societal context. 
and that is how do societies view a process? How do cultures perceive something that is done? Uh, and since we're talking about health and medical communication, we're talking about the human body. What can be exposed, what can be displayed, what you can talk about in quote-unquote polite company. And what constitutes who's polite company? Or what constitutes who can perform certain processes because society says, yes, this is permissible, no, this is not. What are visuals that you can show in public spaces in a society in terms of their acceptability? Yes, this is permissible, no, this is not. So this is where the societal context needs to be considered in relation to the physical context as well to determine how to design things. Anybody feeling overwhelmed yet? Me too. Um, so what, where do we begin? How do we look at things? Well, if we try to identify variables, we're going to use, I like acronyms, we're going to use this really weird acronym called MCSA. Not CSAM run, but MCSA. What does it mean, you ask? Thank you for asking. Well, it looks at five different objectives we need to try to achieve when we design something in a different cultural environment, both the physical context and the societal one. But like with those questions we looked at earlier, it needs to be performed in a specific process, first, then second, then third, then fourth, in order to create a design that effectively meets both of those conditions. So what I'd like to do very quickly is sort of run through what these are and talk about how they affect design practices. So the, the place you start, perhaps the most important place in all, is this concept of accessibility. And since we're in a communication field, this is how individuals access information. How do they get to the information you're trying to present to them? So what do you need to consider internationally along those lines? Well, we start with modality. What is the mode or the primary mechanism through which the members of this culture get medical information? Is it an app on a handheld phone? Is it a website on a laptop or a desktop computer? Is it a printed document that they pick up from the library or their physician's office? Is it a television broadcast or a radio broadcast that they get in their home? All, whatever the modality is, the information you're providing to them must meet it. Uh, back to my question about folks with, with helping their parents with cell phones and such. Uh, how many of y'all find that you've got to help an older family member deal with the technology all the time? And I'm not trying to be pejorative because my kids do it for me also. Okay, next question. How many of you find that your parents or your grandparents expect information to be conveyed in a different way than you do? You might like to read something online. Your parent or grandparent really wants the physical copy to look at. And we've all met people who, please, don't make me read it. Just tell me what you want, it to, want me to do. I'd rather look at the DYI video on YouTube than read the manual. We all have different modalities we prefer, and many cultures have different mod modalities they prefer based upon the parameters that they're in. So the first question is, what modality does the culture expect medical information to come through? First part. Let's say it's websites. So we know that they like to sleep. That means in terms of how often I provide updates, when I provide updates, when I refresh things, when I make revisions. Can't be just done around the clock with no regard for you to access it because I think you can access it all the time. I've got to find the windows where you can access that information in your preferred mode and target toward them. So now we've got a new variable that affects this notion of, excuse me, accessibility. What happens if the person likes to read stuff online because they can print it out and want the print physical document because it's the easiest way to get something. We now have the next factor to consider, ancillaries. What other technologies need to be used in addition to the preferred method of access to get information into the hands of the desired audience? Oh fudge, we've got to provide a printer with a laptop, don't we? Yes, we do. Oh, guess what else we have to provide? Ink and paper. These ancillaries, it all builds in. In the final part, how many of y'all use campus email? How many of y'all have had campus email go down? How many of y'all prayed to the IT gods at that point in time? <laughs> oh dear Center for Computing Services, please find a technician who can fix this. Just because the technology is there and it's available doesn't necessarily mean there are people with the skills to service it if something goes wrong. Which means that something else to build in is how dependent are they on this technology? How important, the thing I'm sending to it, how new is it? How much technology support does it require individuals to have to be able to use it like a new piece of software? So these are the variables that we map and look at in terms of the objective of accessibility to determine how do we design something for a specific culture. Once we've mapped them, and once we know, okay, we've got these down, we've met the accessibility objective, 
we move on to the next one. The interesting one, the manageability objective. And manageability is just because we can get information to them in the desired format, can they actually use it? Can they manage the process we're asking them to perform? In many cases, it takes one of two forms. The technology that we've provided is, is too complicated for the average person to use in that setting because they lack the understanding, the background to use it. How many people are old enough to remember defibrillators that have manual paddles? And you would rub them together and you put them on the body. We've all seen like the TV shows and someone goes clear, boom, boom. And then you wait as it recharges. Now that's a really cool piece of technology, but you just can't give it to somebody and say, go for it. There are some complexities to it that really limit how people can use it. As a result, that manageability, can the people we're giving it to manage the process? Can they actually perform the process as is desired? Maybe, maybe not, but we need to figure that out before we design a technology that they can't use. On the antithetical side, there's the low-tech, almost impossible to perform option. That is, here's a very low-tech option to perform a very important medical process, but it requires a great deal of medical knowledge to do. It's not manageable, not because the tools are wrong, but because the knowledge isn't there. Let's take the standard medical device, if we will, the ballpoint pen. Has anybody ever heard of a cricothyrotomy before? Has anybody ever seen the TV shows where somebody's choking and they fall down and somebody magically grabs a pen, rips it apart, and then puts it in their throat, <laughs> they can breathe? That's a cricothyrotomy. Now, pens are easy to find around the world, pretty much, especially the kind that come apart like this. But let me be honest with you, Michael Klein, I love you very much. Before I let you jam this into my throat and cut it open, we're going to have a talk. <laughs> so the process is manageable in terms of the technology is easy to use. But the knowledge needed to do it correctly, to know where the cricothyroid membrane is, to know how to make the incision, to know how to insert it, to know how to watch the patient afterward, is very complicated. So the next part is what we're asking someone to do, given what they have at hand, is it too complicated based upon knowledge that's required to perform a process? In terms of those of us who work in communication, what, what do we document, how do we document it, looks at these dynamics. Yes, you can do it but can you do it well or manageably? Does that all make sense? So now we're accessible. We figure out what the process to be manageable so people can perform it. Now we hit the C part where things get interesting. And C is comprehensibility. And comprehensibility involves understanding, but understanding that has two different components. Um, the first is content. And the problem with content is we can write up and ask somebody to do something in a language they understand, but do they understand what they're, we're asking them to do? is some sort of specialized knowledge needed to perform a process. Let's take a very highly specialized medical process that requires a lot of really complicated knowledge. Let's take your pulse. Now think about it. If you don't know what a pulse is, and you've never taken one before, and I give you CPR instructions that says, check the patient's pulse, how do you do it? I don't know what you're asking me to do. OK, try this. Take your fingers and place them on the patient's throat and check their pulse. And? Okay, the button. Take your fingers and place them on the patient's throat until you feel something that kind of reverberates. And? Now notice, it assumes that I know what, what a specific thing is. What specific thing does it assume I know? Hmm? Pulse. Pulse. It assumes I know what a pulse is. If I assume that, but don't know you know for sure, then all the instructions I read are worthless because you don't have the content knowledge to understand what I'm asking you. And that's simply a matter of what can I assume the, an audience knows when I ask them to perform a process. Okay, so we're on the same page in terms of knowledge. A pulse is the steady rhythmic response or touch you feel when you place your fingertips on a blood vessel in which blood is moving through at a certain rate. You take the pulse by, so I provided the instructions that needed the content part. Now we hit the other part that gets interesting, the conveyance part of the C. And conveyance looks at, well, literacy. So I've, I've got instructions that I've designed for you to use. Um, they're all written up. They're written up very, very well. What do I need to ask? Can you, Can you read? A, a huge problem that you see in many cases, not just in other nations, but in our nation. I've got written instructions for you. Go for it. Did anybody bother to ask if these individuals are literate? And that's not being glib. It's simply a matter of pragmatics. 
Or is it more effective to use images than it is language, written language or written text? We've got to convey that, figure that out before we put lots of money into writing up this documentation. Great, so we've written it up. We've got the best darn English language documentation we've got. And we're going to send it to, oh, I don't know, Botswana. What's the next question we need to ask? OK. Is, is English the language that this is the best one to use? So, so literacy language. What language is used? Um, classic example is Cameroon. It has two official languages, English and French. But it turns out for many of the elderly populations, they don't use either. They use more indigenous languages to communicate. So documentation written in English or French might not work with certain audiences because they're not the ones that are used. OK, so that's not going to work. We've got to figure it out. We've got the literate population. We've got the right language. We're set to go. In order to perform a Heimlich maneuver, we need to locate the xiphoid's process. Then the distal part of the xiphoid bone, uh, the xiphoid, I mean the xiphoid bone, the second rib down, whoa, hang on. What do we need to figure out next? Lang level, register. OK, they're literate. We know the language they're literate in. What register, what level of literacy do they have in that language? So we write for it. These all sound cheesy in retrospect, but they're important. Because there are assumptions we make all the time when we say, this works for me. I know my experiences. Your experiences must be the same, correct? The whole patient experience design? No, it's not. OK, we figured out what it takes to get something to a person. We know the process is manageable. Now we know that it's comprehensible. Now here's where things get interesting. Next part. Sustainable. OK, these are instructions on how to treat a major bacterial infection. Here's how to do it. You do it once a week this week, once a week at this time next week, once a week, five times a week at these time intervals, and let me know. Uh, excuse me, we've only got one shipment of this antibiotic. How are we going to do this weekly basis thing? I don't quite know. Sustainability looks at the process you're asking someone to perform. How sustainable is it in the context that the patient is in? So back to the whole antibiotics thing. Do we have access to medical technology, medical materials at one time only? Or do we have sustained access to it? Uh, for those of you who work in sort of anything dealing with pharmacological products, that's a huge difference in terms of how you dose things and the kinds of doses you can give over time based upon you can only do this once, you get to do it once a month, or you get to do it once a week based upon sustainability. So that's the first question. Do we need to do this once or do we do it multiple times? The next question, we're back to infrastructures. Well, we can do this every week during the dry season. But during the rainy season, the whole transportation infrastructure is going to be wiped out due to flooding. So we can't do it then. Wait a minute. This medical process has got to go across both seasons. What do we do? What do we tell individuals to do? Sustainability. We need to think through those kinds of factors to determine how to perform the process according to those dynamics, whether it's one shot or over time. Final part of sustainability, back to physical environment. Uh, who here has been to Arizona in the summertime? All right. Now, imagine you've got a, a liquid product, a liquid pharmaceutical product, that you've got to leave out in the hot sun all afternoon. Now, let's just imagine that product was designed for the air-conditioned lab in, I don't know, Delaware. Anybody see some problems there? Now, imagine if that same, pro that same product is not only in the deserts of Arizona, but it's up in the Yukon in Nome, Alaska in February, outdoors. What's that liquid pharmaceutical product going to do in that environment? So sustainability also looks at the design of the product itself and the environment it's kept in. The viability, how is it connected to that environment? And do we need to provide special instructions that tell the patient, tell the user, how to treat, store, package, work with that technology in that environment to keep it sustainable and viable over time? So those kinds of differences. Again, we can't take our experiences and map those onto somebody else. OK, we're almost home. We've got four of the five objectives figured out. The last one should be easy. It's acceptability. Kind of like, um, I need to create documentation to show individuals how to use certain kinds of birth control, like condoms or um, diaphragms. And it's going to be all visuals. So we're going to distribute this in pick a country. Anybody see some problems that might arise? So we're back, again, it is we can get it to them. It's a process folks can understand. They understand what's being expected of them and how to perform it. It's something that can be sustained over time versus the local environment. The final hurdle, perhaps the most important one, is will the audience actually use it because they think it's acceptable? 
can, will they look at it and say, I don't consider this offensive, I can act on it, I can use it, I can perform this process. In many cases, this comes down to visual design dynamics. And again, medical communication deals with the human body. And large parts of the human body are taboo to talk about, share, or work with in public spaces or across different sexes. So in such, in such cases, the question becomes, what is an acceptable design that can be used in this context once well, you get it to folks? And it can be a stumbling block. Um, it's a stumbling block that has been looked at here through what was the Humanitarian Demining Information Center in terms of how to depict female comic book characters for young audiences in Central America. It applies to health and medicine also. Can we show a mammogram in this way in a brochure that's passed out in high schools in this area? Can we show, again, birth control information or AIDS prevention information using exclusively visuals in this culture this way? So map, these are the variables that we map whenever we try to figure out how do we contextualize care or care-related communications for different cultures. This is the foundation of IPXD. We know the when, where, who, and what, which affects the how. But we also need to know, based upon the physical context and the social context, how do we achieve these objectives? What do we need to pay attention to and address when we design something so it can be used in that context by the intended audience, so it mirrors their experiences so they can use it effectively without problem? And that, in a nutshell, is what I came here to talk to you about today. So this is sort of the framework. This is contextualized care. And these are the various variable factors we need to talk through, talk about, and work with when we design for it. Any questions? Thank you. I have a rude question to ask. How, how was I on time? Nobody fell asleep, so it couldn't have been that bad. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, questions, if not questions, comments, suggestions? Again, this is a methodology that I'm interested in people trying, using, experimenting with to carry research in this area forward. Yes, so, I mean, it's, it's similar to what people look at in implementation science, like mm -hmm. instead of a top down, it's bottom up. Yep. So, what are people doing besides, I mean, I guess maybe this is it, is partnering mm -hmm. with people in these communities? How do you find the Cultural broker, mm -hmm. what, how are people right. managing all of this? Uh, great question. The, it's a top-down approach. And the reason it's top-down is quite simply, it's, uh, I think the expression is the last mile from the dock to the door. Okay. And it's, you can get something into a country, into port, but you've got to get it through the government structure there oh. to get it to the patient to actually use it. Yeah. This kind of structure is designed to move it from the dock to the door. Once we're at the door, then we can look at the very specific context of the individual, where, when do you do this? Where are you? Who is there? But we've got to get it to their door. So it's how do we use these objectives designed to get it there and then work with them. But it's all about field research, and more of it needs to be done. And it's got to be more ethnographic, observational, talk about protocol, the kinds of things that involve interacting with other human beings, uh, observing their behavior. It can't be, you know, based upon this idea we do it. Or we do it this way here, but not there. So it's, we've got to get into the field, if you will, and it's got to be top up once you get to the doorway and once you can look at that contextualized design. So these are two parts of an overall process, if you will, top down, bottom up. Does that kind of answer your question? Thank you. Other questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. Do you think we should further train people to, uh, if they perhaps live within a community, mm -hmm. they have a better understanding mm -hmm. of the cultural background of the mm -hmm. community. Should we then be training those people to yes. care for people more than having people come in? We need to train international healthcare workers to also be master ethnographers. And whenever they come back to tell others how to offer care in that environment based upon very careful observation, and these dynamics let them know what to pay attention to and to catalog. So if I know you're looking for these things, and I know you're going to report them, I know how to act on them. But that's kind of a huge hole that needs to be addressed. It's training the medical care providers to be collectors of this information. Médecins sans frontières, doctors without borders, they should have an ethnographer with them every time they go somewhere to record these things. Now, that requires training and that requires funding. So now we're back to thinking about how do we partner with nonprofits, how do we partner with for-profits, how do we partner with government organizations 
to come up with the kind of funding to offer the training. But it also is a matter from an educational perspective, do we need to rethink parts of our curriculum so in teaching this, we integrate this into, say, the public health course. We integrate this into the nursing course. We integrate this into the computer design course, the app design course, the engineering course. So it's, it's awareness raising, it's training, but it's getting people to think about it in a systematic way. So back to our cognitive processes, when we're talking to each other, we know exactly what we're talking about and how to assess it versus guessing. Did that answer your question, ma'am? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, your last two, I think, sustainability uh -huh. and acceptability. Um, I know there's been some research, um, at least domestically, mm -hmm. on compliance mm -hmm. with patients and medicines, mm -hmm. especially the ones that you have to take, like you're saying, antibiotics. Yep. And, and um, as far as asking patients, why aren't you taking, mm -hmm. you know, if you didn't right. finish, why, that kind right. of thing. Um, I'm wondering, has there been any follow-up um, internationally with any, like you mentioned right. the ethnography, mm -hmm. I didn't know if there's been any follow-up research with any of that mm -hmm. as far as looking to see mm -hmm. it about compliance or it, it ha does it have to do with the, the design right. or mm -hmm. does it have to do, you know? Right. Awesome question. Um, short answer, I don't know. Okay. The long answer, um, I don't know, but I'd be curious to see if the research that is done in it, is it tracking survey data? Like we did a survey, we did an interview, or is it tracking observational data? Oh, okay. We don't even domestically. I mean, it's one thing to ask a patient, "When do you take your meds?" Okay. But we all know patients fudge. Yeah. So when we observe the patient, if, if we have permission to or can observe the patient in their household, what are they actually doing? So I think it's a matter of whether it's domestically or internationally, realizing we've got to collect behavioral data as well as the sort of direct response data. But it's a great question. It's a great, great area for research moving forward. Thank you. I'm sorry, did that kind of address your question? Yeah, I did. Okay, I thanks. just didn't know if there was any research being done. Or there could well be. The WHO might. I'm not aware of it. But this is that's not exactly my soup, my field. Okay. Uh, that's a whole way of saying it. It's something to look into. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions, comments, suggestions? Desires for cash donations? <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. So you talked about the, the user experience mm -hmm. and designing for that, and I know that's a, a hot topic in other areas. Mm -hmm. For instance, you mentioned apps and mm -hmm. websites and things like that. Um, perhaps the, the crossovers you've addressed to a certain point, are there, are there areas where um, user experience for the, the medical field or mm -hmm. the health field does not cross over with user experience in other areas where the, the framework has some, some differences. Right. A great question. Honest answer, I don't know, because I've not really studied the comparison across it. Sure. Uh, what I do know is the fields that seem to have invested a great deal into understanding these dynamics tend to be technology. Hardware and software are very much so in terms of technology design. Mobile devices are very much so in technology design. The question is, can pharmaceutical, medical device, healthcare providing companies, what can <coughs> we borrow from those models that kind of look at these issues? So, I mean, a lot of the stuff we've talked about comes out of this ICT for D thing I talked about earlier. How are they approaching this notion of designing things? And how can we borrow, put together implements of it for medical situations? Thank you. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Other questions, comments? If you do have others, please feel free to talk to me at some point later on today. I'll be here through Wednesday. I feel like a stand-up comedian. I'm here through Wednesday. Um, <laughs> my email is here. Please feel free to contact me at any time. I've got business cards that I'd love to give away. Let me know. Thank you all very much for the chance to speak with you this evening and to be here. Y'all have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. And if you would like to continue the discussion, we'll be meeting at 7 o'clock at Taste at Thai on South High Street, and you're welcome to join us for dinner at that time. But thank you very much uh, for coming. Have a good evening.